No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world, and today I'm having a sit down with somebody who has been the talk of the internet for the last few years. I've been following you for a lot longer than that, though, for the record. <laughs> Thank you. Taylor Lorenz in the building. How you doing? Thanks for having me. I feel like a lot of people are going to want to ask about the mask right away. Yeah, I know. I got to I gotta address it. I got, unfortunately, been very sick, and I have no immune system, like literally. Mm. So what's a cold to somebody can put me in the hospital, so I'm not fucking around. Not that I think that you're sick, but. Right, but so you went really, really hard to avoid getting covid but then still somehow it snuck through no i wasn't avoiding it that's the problem i thought i was safe because oh. i had other friends that had gotten covid many times and i was like oh whatever it's not a huge deal mm -hmm. i got covid outside um and yeah it up really really badly and i now my immune system's like completely shot so wow. yeah i feel like the long like i definitely feel like i still feel the effects in some way of getting it a couple years ago like it just doesn't i don't know i never felt like i really got back to 100 percent. it's not good i wish that the government would like invest in some shit. i i sound insane saying this but i really think like ai needs to like i'm like can't we get ai to like come up with some sort of cure that actually maybe like a COVID nft <laughs> I feel okay. So I, this is just fresh in my mind, but I was listening to a podcast this morning with this poker player who's like a top level po poker player, but wears the mask and is like completely ha has never been seen in public without it. And he's been getting a lot of sh from the poker community, certain people in it for probably like just wearing the mask to obscure his facial features so that he people can't pick up reads on them or whatever. So I say that just to say, are there any like elements of wearing the mask still that you appreciate does like does it help give you the poker face as a journalist I or was something literally just thinking of that recently because i had to do an in-person interview mm. and i was like it definitely keeps people from maybe seeing like my goofy smile but i don't know i mean people are really weird about it because it's gotten really politicized mm. so like it's more just like people being like weird about it i i have a huge believer in personal liberty i'm like i'm wearing my mask it doesn't affect you like let me live it looks but. like a meme waiting to happen but <laughs> i think we both can look forward to that right <laughs> no but there's okay there was a girl who worked at this i'm, I'm not even going to describe it but like a business that i was frequenting and i saw her for like two years with the mask on and totally had like an amount of attractive or attraction towards her that promptly dissipated the moment that I saw her without the mask. Oh, yeah. And that really kind of me up because that made me think, like, what even is it to be attracted to someone if this tiny sliver of how their nose and mouth are proportionate to each other was enough to completely change the way that my, like, I felt inherently on a real biological level? That's, like, a whole meme in China. Like, there was this, like, whole thing. I follow this, like, TikToker that just, like, talks about talks about memes in china and they were saying it's this thing actually it's more for men mm. like men trying to look hotter because like a lot of men maybe they don't have the jawline they want or whatever mm -hmm. so they've got the mask i personally think i look best you know without the mask but <laughs> okay it works you know <laughs> right i mean i haven't seen you without the mask in real life so i'm just gonna have to go with this <laughs> but um yeah i mean how how has that been I feel like you've kind of become like an easy stand in for like long COVID obsession on Twitter and stuff. Like a lot of people on the right kind of use you as a stand in for yeah. everyone who kind of falls into that category. Does that uh, does, does that bother you or is that just kind of part of doing the job at no, this point? No, it doesn't bother me. My feeling about Twitter is like, I mean, so after Elon banned me for reporting on him, I got back my accounts on all these like restrictions basically so like I people can't find me like my reach is all fucked up I lose access to features sometimes oh so you're like a porn star that's, <laughs> that's what all the porn stars I have know. to deal with that's crazy it's crazy so like anyway I just was like you know what COVID is this issue that I really care about I've lost many friends to COVID I've lost loved ones to COVID like it's a real fucking problem mm. neither political party seems to give a shit about fixing it mm. personally I think getting disease is bad and I'm gonna post about it you know like long COVID is real people up like i don't think that should be a political issue mm. and also i'm a big believer in workers rights and sort of labor organizing and stuff and i have a lot of friends and family members that work in the service industry that work in you know more blue collar jobs and they're being forced to work when they're sick you know mm. they can't even have like days off to rest now we have the president sort of like you know forcing people back to work so yeah i, I don't like that that the poker player that i was referring to he was just mentioning that people still call him a sheep for wearing the mask which is so, which is so funny right it's because nobody does it anymore yeah, right but they always say shit that i mean that's just like they're i mean nothing is more of a sheep comment than calling someone a sheep like at that point it's like 
listen to yourself. Listen to what you're saying. You sound like an idiot. It's not a detailed enough critique. Yeah. Also, it's like, like you said, like literally everyone else doesn't wear it anymore. Right. So. It's the opposite of being a sheep to wear it now. It actually shows like an extreme level of dedication that most people couldn't dream of. Totally. Also, it's like, why don't we have clean? We have clean water. Now that we know that the air is full of diseases and why don't we have clean air? We already have ventilation standards. All we have to do is upgrade ventilation. I'd love just if the government could get their together, give us clean air. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like other countries have that, you know. Right. But whatever in the meantime i've got my mask so i respect that i mean just being in the airport recently and just seeing all these old people rocking it and like realizing that they're not double masked for no reason like they're clearly the most concerned about this and then also having a kid now is she's just like going to school and just getting colds and just bringing it back home left and right and i'm like a person who never really got sick that much and definitely there's been like a uptick in how often me and my girl get sick just because of my kid now it's crazy. I mean, kids are just like little vectors of disease, but mm. the airports are so disgusting. And I was thinking I was back in New York um, last summer on the subway and I was just I used to ride to work every day in this like packed, disgusting subway. where People are coughing in your mouth. And I was just like, I will never even if COVID disappeared tomorrow, I'd mm. wear a mask on the subway. It's just gross. Yeah, I don't think that's too crazy. But uh, are you missing the New York lifestyle and how, how long you've been gone? Because like. Won't- yeah. That's like the, the the journey as a journalist is like you think this is the place you're going to make it. And now it's kind of like not like that so much. Right. I totally agree. I Yeah. I mean, I'm, I've lived in New York over half my life. I was born in New York. I love New York. Um, I moved here about two and a half years ago. I think New York is great in your 20s mm. and L.A. is great in your 30s. Mm. Like, I'm glad I lived in New York when I did. I'll probably end up back in New York at some point. But especially for what I cover which is like content creator world, TikTok and stuff. Like everything is out here. It's so much easier to be out here. And also just like objectively better lifestyle in LA. Right. Yeah, no, definitely. So was it always your plan to go into covering, you know, influencers and technology and all this kind of stuff? Like when when did that become what you thought that your time should be spent on? Yeah. Well, I graduated like a lot of millennials. It was the Great Recession. Mm. Uh, there was no jobs. I was working at a call center and just doing other dumb And then... Um, I started blogging. This was like in the height of blog era. And so I got an audience on Tumblr Mm -hmm. and that kind of got me into internet stuff. It was more just like seeing other friends. I had a few friends that were like early first generation YouTubers, big on Tumblr, ran kind of like meme accounts, things like that. And the way that the mainstream media was covering the internet was just so out of touch and bad. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, I feel like I could write articles. I met this guy who was a reporter at the time and he was only like my age, like I think he was like 25. And I was like, okay, if this guy's a reporter at 25, like I feel like I could do it. So I just started writing um, about, th- I wanted to write about the internet from the perspective of somebody that actually used it and like actually knew what they were talking about, I guess, mm-hmm. kind of. Um, so that's what got me started. I started blogging and then wrote for like bigger and bigger websites. Yeah, because I can kind of remember this era when we first started to see legacy media covering internet things in a way that actually made sense. And it was this weird feeling of like, oh, we're not just going to be able to do on the internet without like the New York Times eventually noticing. (laughs) Um, But yeah, so okay, the New York Times was your first job. No. As a journalist, or oh, no, how, no, how'd no. you get there? Oh no, I ended up there. I no, my. I mean, I first started writing for like small blogs, like the Daily Dot, mm. a bunch of blogs that don't exist anymore, Mike.com, a bunch of those like digital media, like millennial viral news sites. That Buzz mostly feed. failed. They all, they're all gone now. <laughs> yeah. They're all out of business. But you know, Mashable. Mm. I guess they're still around. Um, but I would write, you know, for those places and for my own Tumblr and stuff. And then I wrote for bigger and places. I, I was I actually worked at the Atlantic before the New York Times. Right. Okay. Yeah. And I had like subbed in as a social media editor at the Atlantic um, years before because I was good at social media. I would always run social media for brands and stuff on the side, and so I knew people there. I ended up interviewing there, and um, yeah. And then the New York Times recruited me really aggressively from the Atlantic, and I was like, I kind of never really aspired to work at the New York Times, but I was like, sure, I'll try to work there. It was a big newsroom, and. It was great. And when you started there, did you feel like they mostly gave you free reign to cover the things that you wanted, or were they, like, assigning you things? Yeah, I had a great editor named Corey Sika when I first started there, and then I had another amazing editor named Pui Wang. Both of them are, like, honestly two of the best editors I've ever worked for, and they've always let me cover pretty much what I what I wanted to do, write mm-hmm. about, which was great because they— it was an uphill battle kind of right. explaining. Because early on, what kind of stuff were you covering as opposed to, like, what you've kind of landed on? Well, I always 
covered like viral internet culture stuff. It's just that it used to be more like explainers. So it's like you had to just be like, you couldn't just be like, here's what I think about this new vlogging format or here's what's happening on the internet. You had to be like, here's who Logan Paul is. Let mm. me write this basic thing. And so, I mean, I think at The Atlantic, then The Times and where I work now too, it's like you get to go a little bit deeper mm. and you get to like, you start with the presumption that people kind of know what you're talking about. Right. I mean, I wrote a big story about like call her daddy and when Alex Cooper left or whatever, you know, that sort of deal and the business implications of her deal with Barstool. And so, yeah, it was more about sort of the economics of the industry. Right. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, now it's kind of like in order to explain certain like slang or, or certain trends on social media, though, it's kind of like almost impossible to start somebody off, like explain it from the very beginning, because there's just so many layers of technical like like changes to the slang over the years and whatnot. Like. Uh, so how do you approach that when you're working for a major publication where you don't know if the person reading it is going to be somebody who's like super TikTok fluent or, you know, my mom who really needs everything right. explained to her? I know. I mean, most of the places that I write for are it's an older audience, mm -hmm. you know, like if you look at the comments of my articles. So I'm writing in a sort of more basic way, but I generally give credit. I mean, people always say boomers are not online. Nobody spends more time on Facebook in with like minion memes and stuff than like boomer. Like they do mm. use the internet, you know. So I think we don't have to talk down to them, but it depends how I talk about my stories. Like the actual article might be written for like a little bit of an, a person that's not as familiar, but then when I take that article and share the news on TikTok or YouTube or I make content about it, I'm usually just talking to my audience, which is mostly young people. Right, because I was reading something the other day about how there's like just such a race on TikTok to come up with names and identifying, yeah. you know, labels for things that are happening in society and there's just all these things that were consistently happening throughout history that never had a name but now there's like a real competition to name those things like even the the, the trad moms and the trad wives yeah. and all that kind of stuff which my whole life I would have thought of as just being like a regular mom but now that's like a real label and the, and and once you have a label that allows you to argue efficiently and like go at other groups of people and stuff and like a lot of that work is almost stuff that would have had to be explained to people through you know media pr prior and it's just like such a strange state of affairs that we've gotten to right yeah well i think all those tiktokers realize what like media realized a long time ago which is that if you come up with like a catchy name mm. or you can sort of articulate a trend that allows like you said people to talk about it and it generally pops like it'll get a certain amount of traction because people mm. are like oh i know that like oh i know what a beige mom is or a coastal grandmother or yeah whatever. so you got way better examples right there <laughs> <Yeah>, coastal <laughs> grandmother that's like a whole aesthetic um but i do think it's it's led to this obsession with content creators just sort of like desperately like trying to come up and sort of manufacture these things where it's like some of them they're really reaching yeah i mean i deal with this constantly in the the rap world where it's like the the people who are coming up as content creators are just like without realizing that this is what they're doing they're just grasping at any strain of drama in larger yes. creators yes. content for them to grasp onto and grab and try to find some kind of narrative and i get it because it really is probably the only way that they're going to be able to get noticed is by taking bigger creators and putting them in their content and stuff but it, it's weird to see them doing this without seeming to have any kind of self-awareness about what they're doing and how weird it is yeah a hundred percent. I mean, that's just like age old Internet is like if you want attention, you got to go after somebody bigger than you, because if they acknowledge you or they respond to you or whatever, that like raises your clout. And then suddenly you're in the mix mm -hmm. and, you know, definitely. So, OK, what does something have to in terms of like a TikTok trend or like a style of content or a certain creator in your mind? Like what level do they have to reach in order to be worth writing about in a major publication? Because there's so many people that would, i'll get emails about like do you want to interview this this tiktok girl and it's like she has nine million followers and i'm just digging and digging trying to figure out like what could be the thing that makes her interesting and there's really not much there She's and i'm hot. sure yeah it's yeah. usually the hot thing but it's like dudes too like but yeah. but to me it's kind of like well what separates separates bryce hall from like these 10 other hot dudes with floppy hair that i don't know about you know yeah. shout out to bryce because i mean someone like him he's got enough personality but i also wouldn't say that he rises to the occasion of being like a washington post article because unless there was some extreme drama written, or something. i think i wrote about bryce's power getting turned off when he was partying in 2020 oh yeah yeah that was, yeah. A, that was a good era yeah 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 <laughs> okay i remember that so yeah. he was in the new york times but um but no i mean i 
I think like for me, it's not as much the size of the audience. It's more like what does their rise say about the internet or some platform or the content creator industry or like the entertainment landscape. So it's like, you know, with like, uh, did you see the who the f did I marry TikTok drama at all? Oh, this 50 part series. Yeah, this I didn't did. watch any of it, but I read some explainers about it. Yes. It was this like eight hour long thing. But it's like that woman doesn't have that many followers. She had under a million as of a day ago. But like she created this long form interesting series. So it's like you might write about it because that's interesting, like doing long form content on TikTok or I'm writing a story right now on. Do you know what retention editing is? Uh, Like Mr. Beast. Yes, and exactly. Yeah, like yeah. The, uh, something happens every like. You know, there's a bunch of creators that are not Mr. Beast level, but they sort of pioneered that style. And mm. so it's like they're relevant in the context of that story. So for me to write about someone, it's like, what, what does this person's popularity or what is their content? Like, what's interesting? What is like, what's the lesson that you can learn from it? Or like, what's the interesting kind of thing from it? So they don't the, have to be big. Reading about the retention editing thing really makes me feel like an idiot because I've just been doing podcasts and just putting them out at, at any <laughs> length. And then I start to realize like, oh, there's people who are really studying that if you put something out that's two minutes and 59 seconds, then that's going to do significantly better than something that's three minutes. And I'm like, holy shit. I'm ne but I also like I think you just have to draw a line in the sand somewhere and be like, this is not why I started making content to just like optimize for for viewership. But I don't know. Like, I mean, do you think Mr. Beast can transcend past YouTube? Yeah. I mean, I know I reported a little bit on his uh, Amazon Prime deal that's right. in the works like uh yeah, he's so big, and I mean, he's got staff of hundreds, and like he, he's really running an entertainment empire. It, imagine the way that Coco Melon has, I mean, Coco Melon has a streaming deal now. Like Coco Melon's obviously another children's right. Thing. Me, we we agreed early on to not let our kid watch that because it just it's felt like crack. Yeah, it's just too much. Yeah, and you compare that to her watching like Sesame Street, which you it you still see the effect that even a relatively laid back show has on their brain, and yeah. it's like a fucking lobotomy taking place <laughs> right in front of your <laughs> eyes when you see the way that they just can't look away from it. It's disturbing. Yeah. I know. Um, but yeah, I think I mean Mr. Beast is like a genius at what he does, and that's the reason he does it. I think that like unfortunately he spawned this whole. This is what my retention story is, edited, <laughs> is about. It's like. He spawned all these copycats where, like, I think people think that they can just growth hack their way to audience. And let's not forget that Mr. Beast also started years ago. Mm -hmm. You know, like, he really studied YouTube and he brought in that wave of, like, kindness content. Like, he mm -hmm. was one of the first to really start doing that, like, charity-based. Donating to people with zero viewers on Twitch. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, but even the, the weird, like, saying Logan Paul's name 100,000 yeah. times. Yeah. Like stunts, that, yeah. which is like very uh, easy to forget about that yeah. era. It wasn't that long ago that this guy who we all know now for doing one thing was doing this completely separate thing. Yeah. And he was just trying things out and like working really hard. And, you know, it's gotten to him to where he's gotten. And I think he seems pretty great at what he does. You know, I do see a bunch of people trying to push the like Mr. Beast is slowly shrinking narrative which i don't know if i really go for that i think that if anything the the, the pandemic accelerated like a lot of his content the squid games thing was just yeah. obviously such a viral idea but i do think it's it's correct to question like to what extent is he successful because of learning to play by the rules of youtube and is he going to necessarily be able to take that outside but i think that amazon show is going to be the ultimate litmus test right totally and i think it's like there's a bad track record, obviously, of, like, YouTubers trying to do TV stuff. But the show is supposed to be a competition show, which he could do. You know, mm -hmm. like, it's, like, enough in line with his content. I don't think he could host a talk show. I don't think he could, like, I, I don't know that he'd be gr that great at that. But mm -hmm. I think he's good at what he does, which is essentially viral competition stuff. So we'll see. I know everyone wants to kind of also, once someone peeks, be like, Oh, they're on the down cloud. You know, they want to be the first one to call out the fall off. Exactly. Yes. But it's like he's also maxed out to a point. I mean, he's got a mm. massive audience. Like he's never going to continue to grow at the rate that he has been growing. Mm. It's just unsustainable. And once you drive a freight train into a giant dirt <laughs> pit, it's kind of like okay, maybe we've we've gotten to the point where like I don't know where you're going to take this from now on. And you certainly, it doesn't seem like you could take it in like a really simple direction whereas like in the beginning so many of his ideas were so basic and he just executed them really well a hundred percent yeah yeah i don't know mr yeah. beast he's a, he's a crazy dude but i mean okay uh another question i really wanted to ask you about was i saw a quote from you saying that certain influencers are impossible to cancel and you used uh trisha and jeffree star i believe as uh examples that that's kind of like the the 
that's not how it's supposed to work. Like yeah. You're supposed to be able to sort of remove people from public life, but somehow certain people just have this like sustaining presence. Like what, to what do you attribute that? Yeah. I mean, I think they just operate outside the bounds of like, they're not beholden to their audience. And I actually feel like people like Jake Paul are kind of similar too. where like, cause I don't, I think people have tried to cancel Jake Paul many times. And, oh yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, he's done some bad shit. I'm not defending him or anything, but, um, but I think it's like, he doesn't have an audience. I think it depends on your audience. It's like, do you have an audience of people that are kind of young people that often look out for they're not very loyal right they're kind of with you because they've supported you in a, in a while but they're kind of waiting to turn on you are they very political or do they have this bond with you where they sort of accept that you're not perfect mm. and if they like you from the beginning for being flawed they're going to be more likely to forgive you but if they put like if you fuck up but if they put you on a pedestal this is what happened this is why i think david dobrik got so fucked when he mm. published that video because it's like he had been put on this pedestal as this like perfect guy like oh he's so family friendly and wholesome right. it's a so it's like, I, I think actually other creators could have done the same thing that he did, which is like post this vlog where this girl, I guess, was, you know, said that she was assaulted in the video. Like, I think other creators could have done that and ridden it out in a different way. But he kind of had this very family friendly image. But he also just seemed like he wasn't ready to sort of sustain that heat. So yeah. he kind of like reverted into doing the Snapchat thing, which you see a lot of people doing that. Yeah. Even, even the Ace family, because there's no Austin comments. In the room. Yeah. Yes. Have you seen his Snapchat stories? Yeah, but now it's like I'm supposed to believe this whole goofy ass storyline he's yeah. putting together about the RV. I, I, when I see that title on a, a Instagram clip or whatever, I don't even really feel tempted to watch it because it's so obvious to me yeah. that this is scripted. But yeah. I don't know. I mean, that that's like a very weird new thing. It's like going from YouTube to Snapchat and and just enjoying the fact that you don't have to read anybody's thoughts about you. A hundred percent. And also, Snapchat's still paying creators a ton of money oh and i've heard absurd amounts of money being yeah. uh, given out on there yeah. yeah i feel like people sleep on snapchat because it's not considered like you know youtube it's like not up there with like youtube and meta and stuff and it is always sort of struggling but and because we're all blind to it because yeah. i'm never gonna know about what the ace family are doing on there unless it rises to the occasion that other accounts have to post about it you know yeah it's just interesting. I had a Snapchat show in 2016, mm. and that was like the previous. That was like when millennials were still using Snapchat. Now I feel like it's it's young people that are on there. Like mm -hmm. it's a lot of children. Yeah, I was reading that like the average teenager, like you know, like 70 percent of them have used Snapchat in the last 30 days, which is fucking insane to think that it's that popular, yeah. and that there's no real reason to switch over to Snapchat besides trying to be kind of mysterious about whatever you're doing. Yeah. It's weird. It's just this like sleeper. And I think because they sell interstitial ads, like that's how, they're giving everyone a portion of those ads that they're yeah, selling. Right. Like, and they do a lot of, yeah, they do a lot of inventory. So mm. good for David Dobrik, I guess. But do you think, because like David Dobrik famously said that he got turned down from like a Netflix show. Do you think that he could have carried something like that? Or do you think that his power was this YouTube style of content that he was making? I think it was the YouTube style of content. Mm -hmm. I think, I mean, look, he was in that daily vlogging era of YouTube. And I think that style of content doesn't translate well to streaming or mm -hmm. traditional linear television. It just doesn't, it's not, it doesn't feel at home. Um, could he have created this, maybe starred in like a scripted series or something? Maybe if he can act. I mean, mm. that's what like Addison Ray has been doing. But he's probably enjoying his life now. He's got the pizza place I don't over think there. He needs any of it. And I he's doing he's Snapchat. Doing he's probably making more than enough yeah. there. And like, because I saw that Jason Nash, his like former podcast co host, said that they got offered $10 million to do a podcast together, which is money that Jason sorely needs. And David was just like, eh, I don't, I don't feel like yeah. doing it. He's sitting pretty. I mean, I think it's also like, how much do you care about having that like prestige of being on Netflix or having that like, and I think a lot of content creators do strive for that, but it's like, why you don't need, you, if you've got the money and I actually don't think young people care as much. I think that stuff used to matter a lot more even five years ago. Mm. Yeah. Like even I remember Joe Rogan and Mr. Beast having a conversation about what Mr. Beast should do. And Joe was kind of like urging him to like, just take one of these big deals that had probably been yeah. offered to him. And Mr. Beast is like incapable of thinking about his career and his art in any way besides like, no, like I am growing on YouTube and that's what this is all about. And it's interesting though, because I feel like now Joe probably would have a better appreciation for that because even though he's never really said it, I think that his 
pride was maybe wounded a little bit by definitely losing viewership when he switched over to Spotify, which I'm not discounting the fact that obviously he's gigantic because <laughs> people are going to be like, oh, you're acting like Joe's irrelevant. But, you know, like he I, I think that in some way as a content creator, you can't help but know how many people are watching your shit. And if you if you really care and if, especially if money's not really an object like him, it's probably a big part of why his Spotify deal got restructured. A hundred percent. And I think Spotify themselves realized that you know, maybe they got the initial bump of fans coming over and consuming content on Spotify, but ultimately they've opened things up and allowing, you know, a lot of their exclusive deals to go publish on other platforms because they realize it's actually valuable to have that reach, mm. you know, and have that cultural impact. It, it sort of feeds back to the show. Do you think Spotify are happy with their investment? Because obviously they pulled back on almost every podcast yeah. that they invested in. <laughs> but now we all, a lot of times when we talk about podcasts on audio platforms, it'll be like, yeah, you know, we put our stuff on Apple and Spotify. So they, they managed to get themselves into that conversation where it's considered a valid place to go listen to podcasts, which previously they weren't really at all. I, yeah, I think which I think was their goal. So mm. I think they achieved that goal. I don't think that they probably made much on those. I mean, they bought Gimlet as well, that big podcast studio that they kind of just shut down because it wasn't really performing mm -hmm. for them. So I think their goal was to get people to listen to Spotify and podcasts. Now people think of Spotify. They don't just think of music. Whereas right. seven years ago, like you wouldn't listen to a podcast on Spotify. It just wasn't in people's behavior. Right. Do you feel, do you ever look at the podcast marketplace and, and feel a little surprised that female hosts are so underrepresented that it, it doesn't feel like so female led podcasts take off the way that sometimes you would expect them. To. I was fighting with somebody about this recently. I've gotten in so many fights with people about this. I a hundred percent agree with you. Mm. If you look at the podcast charts, they're almost, it's all, it's almost all men. And I think especially people don't like to listen to two women on a podcast. It becomes a women's podcast. Mm. And whereas a man and a woman, they'll generally listen more. It's like, but it, and two men, it's just anybody will listen. But two women, it's considered a woman's. I don't know why people write it off like that. Um, I think it's disappointing. I mean, unfortunately, especially as podcasts have gotten more visual and all of these platforms have leaned into video and stuff, too. I think there's a lot of pressure on women um, and people hate women's voices. Like every time I go on a podcast, someone has something to say about, mm. you know, oh, why you you know, you sound like a valley girl or something. But you probably have listened to a lot more Caller Daddy than I have. Why do you think that they kind of buck that trend? Well, they lean very hard into college age women, which mm. were an underserved market um, at that time. And I think that they captured, they were very early and they captured that, like, you know, there was no one speaking to women, young college age women in that way of that sort of like raunchy, like real style way. It was like, I mean, they came up, up to in this like girl boss feminism era where people were just they weren't being like as raw or real. I don't know how to describe it mm -hmm. and like kind of unfiltered. And I think that's what, that's what originally got, obviously Alex now has her interview show and she's not doing his stuff like that, but that's what sort of got them in, but they they leaned hard into, into women. And I think women are an untapped audience. Right. Yeah. Because it just makes me wonder why women don't seem like they gravitate towards female led podcasts and the numbers that you would think, like it's easy to understand why Joe Rogan has a huge audience and that it's probably 80% 90% male but sometimes like I've had that conversation with my wife and it's kind of hard for her to pinpoint as well like she doesn't really understand why there aren't more podcasts that appeal to her and the question is like what are women listening to besides true crime I know well, and Trisha Paytas. True crime. <laughs> yeah I mean I was thinking of this recently because I realized almost all the podcasts I listen to are men it's weird and I'm a woman but like I'll listen to these like culture podcasts or whatever and um maybe they'll have I guess like you know there's a woman on there sometimes but um i think it's just an under tap uh, like it's an underserved market and also mm. people just discount women's interests a lot like the things that women are interested in are, are always sort of considered unserious or like business fashion podcasts have dealt with this where like they're in like the culture section they're not in the business section even if they're reporting on the business of fashion or the business mm. of culture it's like they're sort of like always like put into a separate category but how much uh, Fresh and Fit and whatever have you watched over the years? <laughs> Too much. It's but that's my women brain. represented in podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No. Oh my god. But it's like, I mean, look, those are people using women for clicks, right? Right. So, um, and no. I know so many women that will just happily drive up there and and to Santa Barbara to be on whatever and stuff. And I hear them having the conversations like the OnlyFans girls about like, is it worth it and how much abuse they can necessarily expect to take up there and everything. And it's, uh, I don't know, it's, it's, just, it's definitely a weird racket, especially when you consider that it seems like 
a lot like it's, at, at a certain point when whatever popped up i was like oh is there gonna be one of these in every major city yeah. that is just gonna like use this natural resource of young women to have conversations with that don't make them look terribly good yeah i it there's too much of it i was scrolling on instagram the other day and i got this podcast of these four high school boys it's pretty wholesome but they're saying the crazy some crazy shit and i'm just like why are <laughs> there's like that meme of like we need young we need to like revoke young men's access to microphones like mm. i do think there's like a certain amount of like young men that know and p young people generally but i think men lean into it often like teenage boys they know if they say kind of inflammatory things or antagonize some woman like that clip is going to get attention that's going to go by you know mm. so they're just using women for engagement I always wonder if young dudes are like that still, because when I was 16, for sure, like the entirety of my sense of humor was like, let's figure out the most offensive thing that we could say and just push it as far as it can go. And all the bands I liked at that time in terms of like punk and hardcore were kind of like right on the edge of what would be acceptable. But now it just feels like you're playing with fire so much if you're a, a dude doing that kind of stuff, which obviously they're young, so they don't really know what they're doing. But like in a world now where you could so easily become, you know, a headline, it just 100%. feels like there's got to be such a strong incentive. Like that's got to be such an important conversation that you have with your like teenage son is like, listen, like there's a lot of shit you cannot do because that Snapchat video of you singing the N-word is, is going to be the thing keeping you out of Harvard. Totally. Also, just like with facial recognition these days like i think people are going to be able to dig up a lot of content on people mm, definitely so okay would you say you're fully out of love with twitter at this point and is it just because it's owned by somebody who has kind of declared you an enemy yeah i don't care about that i it's annoying because he's put all these restrictions on my account oh, that that's, too, yeah. that's what's annoying about it um i also you know i think I, I've always been an Instagram person. I think just like as a millennial, like I do, I've always spent more time on Instagram than Twitter. It was just like for media people, Twitter is where news happens. Mm. I think that's less and less so. I actually think that's been completely replaced by TikTok anyway. Like even before Elon took over, I noticed that like where do pop culture trends emerge? Where do like people, people go for sort of discussion? Where do clips go viral? Like it's, it's TikTok. Right. And I always use this example too. Like I was driving to Malibu recently and there was like, you know, crazy shit happening on the side of the road and i think it's like 10 years ago five years ago i would have maybe like taken a picture or tweeted about it now it's like you take the video and you put it on tiktok because mm -hmm. you know that so i just think that's where p things happen yeah in a way that like it used to be twitter for me like a big part of the appeal of twitter uh during the first 10 years or whatever was basically just being able to sort of be a fly on the wall and listen to the conversations that journalists were having and yeah. other smart people and more and more, it starts to feel like Twitter is just not that anymore. It's like, it, and I also have a theory that the first 20 minutes of Twitter out of your day is usually pretty good because the For You page is pretty good at like serving yeah. you the most Im important, salacious things that have happened. But then I've had days where I'm like on set filming something and I end up so bored that I look at Twitter for four hours out of the day. And by the time you get past that hour or two hour mark, it's like, it's just really serving you garbage yeah. and so many of the people that i respect that if i were to really go through who i follow have just basically ceased using the platform yeah. you know like like somebody like you i would love to like go on twitter and see some sort of like weird journalistic infighting going on between you and somebody else <laughs> and it's just most people are not on there They're as intently there. anymore most journalists have i mean a lot of most like mainstream journalists have gone to threads and blue sky and other platforms mm. and I like, I mean, I spend time on all those kind of places. I don't love threads. It's very corporate, but. Right. There's never anything extreme you know, on there, right? Brands no no political other. stuff. No, they ban politics, which is everything. They ban this. I mean, Kat Tenbarge, this phenomenal reporter, wrote this piece on revenge porn. And just because the URL of her article mm. had the word porn in it, it was like blocked from search on that. And it's just like, so you can't even write news about things that they consider controversial right so have you had to deal with that or are you kind of insulated from that because you've worked for bigger entities for the most part but i was just reading that like there have been days where jezebel made uh like 50 bucks in a day because so many of their articles focus on things about sex and whatever like different terms and like ads will basically be blocked from almost all advertisers from showing up on a website if there are these terms used yeah and that's got to like completely change what people are comfortable with talking about right well it's decimated like women's media like feminist women's media sex positive women's media 
to the point that now women's media is just like watered down to like fashion recommendations, right. beauty hacks, because like if you talk about abortion or like sex, like that's a big no, no, you mm. know? And I think it's very gendered too, because the men's like the men's magazines and like complex and stuff like they can touch on like these sort of more like raunchy topics and they don't get demonetized. Like mm. everyone sort of expects it, but it's something about like women's, sites that yeah it's just hard out there yeah like it was tough a couple years ago seeing youtube get to the point where you had to like censor your titles and shit but now people do it for tweets as well yeah including words like sex yeah like just the fact that you got to put an asterisk instead of an e it's just like what like what the internet had such promise <laughs> this just makes me feel like what the fuck we're really letting the advertisers make all these decisions no it's t completely radicalized me where like I, I also have just had so many like accounts banned over the years for like just the dumbest shit like stuff like that just something you trigger the wrong thing and it's like hate speech or whatever mm. even though i've never said anything hey, it, it, uh, you'll joke like i want to kill myself or something and it's like oh my god self-harm you know whatever right. um and I think it's really bad. And I think it's a direct result of journalists actually kind of freaking out and asking these platforms to overly moderate content. I think we should, I'm all for sort of allowing users to have control over their online environments. You know, if you want to limit Twitter replies, if you want to like go on a private account, block stuff, block content from people you don't follow, like that's great. But I think this top-down moderation where they sort of seek out the controversial topics to try to censor, it's just, it ends up in it ends up in restricting speech and restricting conversations that we should be having. But like with Twitter, I feel like Elon is someone who he just, he, he claimed, he proclaimed that this was a free speech platform when he took over and mm -hmm. has said that multiple times, but then he's, he's so beholden to the advertisers because that's the only out that he has in terms of not just like hemorrhaging money out of Twitter that he has to fall in line with, you know, basically censoring tweets because of the you know, really well, innocuous words like sex. Yes. And let's not forget that Elon is completely full of shit when he says that mm. no one has banned more of it. Even Elon arbitrarily bans people. He arbitrarily restricts people. He arbitrarily bans accounts he doesn't like, like which whatever he runs the platform. It's his prerogative if he wants to do that. But don't come out claiming that you're a free speech maximalist when you're not, you know? Yeah. I mean, I, I still, like, w my main grudge about him was, uh, in terms of, like, things he's done that really stand out to me is when he tweeted the conspiracy theory about Paul Pelosi oh, yeah. uh, getting attacked because he was having some sort of, like, gay sex encounter. And then he deleted the tweet but never acknowledged it afterwards, yeah. never apologized for it. And to me... That's just, like, I don't want to live in a world in which, like, the most powerful man in the world is, like, spewing conspiracy theories and, like, not the fun ones, not ones that you could kind of be like, wow, maybe he really believes that, but, like, things that there's no factual basis for. Yeah, he's gone <sighs> off the rails. Like, if you look at what he shares, like, he's just, he's super radicalized. He's super anti-LGBTQ. Like, he's super, it's just weird. I don't know. He's gotten really radical, and I don't. Because he's all in on the Great Replacement shit. Oh, 100%. Every day he's yes, tweeting something yes. about that shit. And he interacts. His, his He loves to, like, reply to, like, the most inflammatory, like, crazy shit ever and just be like, interesting. Mm. Or like, hmm. Yeah. And he loves to just say basically, like, oh, I hung out with someone today who who still believes the news. Yeah. What, an, what an idiot. <laughs> and it's like he, he tweets that, like, so consistently that it's just kind of weird to see that be his agenda. Like, it's you, insane. Also, it's like. He, the reason he feels that way is because people report critically on him and he can't take right. it. And my feeling is, like, don't get in the ring if you can't take it. Like, you're a billionaire. Like, shut up. Like, stop whining about the New York Times writing some mean article about you. Mm. You're a billionaire. There's, like, a, a new narrative that is basically, like, the journalists and the media people are, are at fault for uh, Trump being able to seem like he could be successful this uh, in this upcoming election because of the fact that so many journalists like exaggerated how bad he was and maybe maybe he was bad but he wasn't as bad as the media made him out to be do you feel like you have any kind of regrets about how you covered trump or spoke about trump on social media yeah i covered the 2016 election that's and my snapchat show was covering the election i right. was in the room when trump was elected in 2016 at the hilton that night um, I think, I mean, I was covering him more from like the internet standpoint. I think people vastly, journalists vastly underestimated the impact that he had and people didn't believe he could even be president for a mm -hmm. long time. And then I think it flipped where I think 
I think you can see it in the coverage right now. Biden will do the same thing that Trump does. But nobody there's not the inflammatory headlines, whereas when Trump does something, there's like, you know, a freak out. I think that's unfortunate media bias and I really don't support it. I think if people were to go through my work specifically, I completely stand by everything. I think I am very fair and accurate and like, look, Trump did a lot of crazy shit and is worth reporting on. I also think that I, I wish people reported more critically on sort of everyone in the political world. I don't I'm not a huge fan of like politicians generally you know and i there was like a, a day that i remember very fondly where i was sitting at the coffee shop and i i realized i first read about the grabber by the pussy tapes oh, and yeah. i felt this is it there's no yeah. po- nobody no president has ever said or done anything like this there's no <laughs> way he could survive this and i feel like now if this same information was leaked that nobody would really even like even the most hardcore progressives would not assume that this was going to be a big impactful thing for his career like do you think that there's anything that could really move the needle in terms of affecting trump at this point it's so crazy i know i remember when that happened too and being like that's insane um I mean, I think so much has been normalized, like so much of the really toxic stuff that Trump kind of brought forward in our culture, just in the sense of like this antagonistic relationship with the media, this sort of hostility towards certain groups. Like, I think it's just been completely normalized now and it's not shocking to anybody anymore. I think he I think there's some shit that he could do, but it would have to be really bad. Like he'd have to like. I mean, he famously said he could shoot someone and nobody would care um, on Fifth Avenue. He was really prophetic when he said that. Uh, He was kind (laughs) of right. It's like, I I mean, it goes back to that, like, uncancelable kind of personality. It's like people expect outrageous stuff from him. So at this point, people expect it. I don't know. Mm. Um, So there was this viral moment of you crying on an interview that you did. And then soon after that, I think that you said that MSNBC was like worse than yeah, right. Fuck right. MSNBC. <laughs> okay. So how did this whole <laughs> thing go down oh and how was God. it misrepresented? Let me clear that. Like uh, I could talk about it all the time. Um, no. So first of all, the New York times books me on this interview with Kate Sawson, a fellow journalist who's non-binary were on this interview about like women dealing with online harassment, whatever. This is, whatever it was it was kind of like not the best time i had just lost a friend to i had actually lost three friends in a row unfortunately took their own lives like within a very short period of time so i'm like already emotional like whatever i can't cancel this interview because we got kate here whatever three and a half hour long interview i'm reading graphic rape threats death threats like they have me read all this shit she's like you know pushing me and pushing me and pushing me end of the interview the last thing at the interview i'm talking actually i don't give a shit about twitter harassment by the way they like dishonestly framed it as if it was like about Twitter harassment. I'm talking about the stuff that they've done to my family because my family has been driven out of their homes, like had crazy. I mean, the type of shit that like my family and friends have had to deal with because of these psychos online is insane. Mm. So for like one fucking second, I like teared up because I was honestly just like, I'm fucking exhausted. I'm tired. I'm dealing with this emotional shit from like my friends and like, I don't want to be here. And this woman is just like going at me and like having me read the shits. And I, so I like do it. And then I'm like, okay, well, you're not going to use that second where I'm like crying. Like, cause right after that, we cut the interview it's, mm. and we're done. What do they do? They make the three and a half hour long interview. First of all, they misgender the colleague that I'm with, which right. is fucked up. And then they had to label that. On yeah. All they the, like the, the whole segments, thing right? is just like an embarrassing comedy of errors. Then they misrepresented the whole segment was about like Twitter harassment. Mm. It's like, First of all, I have my comments. I don't even see content on Twitter. Sometimes I see my name trending and I click on it. I'm like, what's everyone mad about today? But like, I don't give a shit about Twitter harassment. I give a shit when people are showing up to my parents' house. That's what I give a Mm. fuck about. And um, yeah, they clip it into this two, two, you know, two minute long segment and just like, they're like, oh, Taylor Lorenz, look at this victim. It's like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, I have, I've been covering content creators for almost 15 years now. I mean, you know, Adam, like, I had like PewDiePie make a video about me. I've had so many people at Logan Paul, like Jake Paul. I've had every stupid fandom on the planet come after me. I have an extremely high threshold mm-hmm. when it comes to online harassment. Right. Mostly because it's I deal with children. But um who, you know, the children fans of these influencers. Right. So like I don't care about Twitter harassment. I care again that people are I don't even want to get into all the stuff that's happened to my family, but like that's what I care about. And that was just totally, yeah, totally lied. But so 
now you're kind of in the position where you agree with one of the common right wing critiques of a place like MSNBC because they basically oh, 100%. They, they did to you what the right would say that they do to Trump and everybody 100%. else. Right? And let me just be clear, I've always had a problem with TV news. And I made mm. my I mean, when I was a blogger, I was very I've been very critical of the mainstream media my entire career. Mm. That said, and and I think that especially cable news all cable news is exploitative. It's misleading. It's extremely partisan. Whether you're on the left or the right, they're like, they're pushing a narrative on cable news mm. to keep you entertained. It's just the reality of that business model. Here's my feeling about journalism and all the people that are like, okay, so destroy journalism. Let's all get our news from YouTubers or whatever. I do think that there's a need for journalists, mm -hmm. good, honest journalists. That was an experience with a non honest journalist. And I would never agree to that again honestly i don't trust people it sounds like uh like everybody that oh yeah sure it sounds like everybody who i've ever had a conversation with who was on reality tv where like so yeah. many people feel like they can go into the reality tv arena and be successful <laughs> and don't realize that you do not stand a chance like they're whatever <laughs> narrative they want to get off about you they're going to be able to do it and no matter how you know, well-meaning you are, how well you present yourself, it's just not going to happen because the incentives are for them to make something salacious. And from their perspective, that probably was a successful segment, oh, right? they bragged about it internally. Somebody forwarded me an email where they're bragging about how many YouTube views it got by wow. using my name as clickbait and an image of me crying. And it's just like, how fucked up are you? How stupid are you? Like, to use an image of a woman crying, as you know, like, it's just a very specific gendered image that's like, that's going to be on the internet forever. Mm. So, yeah, I hate MSNBC more than Fox News, honestly. I do, because at least Fox News, it's like, you know what you're getting. I don't, you know, if they want to yell about me, whatever. Mm. But um, I, I, I hate all cable news. Did equally, that change how you viewed the work that was coming out of, like, some of the places that you've worked? Like, maybe, like, oh, fuck, there maybe are some things that come out of the Times or the Post. Oh, I've or... always. I, let, some of my earliest blog posts were bashing the New York Times. Like, mm. I have always been somebody, which is why I was so surprised when they wanted to recruit me. I also ran, like, somewhat extreme. Like, I mean, I've made very, like, critical statements about the media my entire career. Mm. I feel like... Um, that again, that doesn't mean that I don't think that journal. I think it's really important to have journalism. The thing, the reason that we need places like the New York Times and all and and the Washington Post and all of these places that yes, they do a lot of fucked up stuff. Sometimes I see stuff on the website that makes me want to die. I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe I work from this place. What are they publishing? But they give journalists resources to do investigations. Import. I mean, we did this phenomenal series last year on like the AK-47. I think it was the AK-47. Just sort of like guns you know, how this gun manufacturer had sort of become so commonplace, why it's used for certain shootings. Like, mm -hmm. there's just investigations, like, corruption. You're not going to get nine months to investigate something mm. when you're a content creator. You're on this turn. And at least when there is controversy about something posted by the Times, at least it feels like they are in some way open to the criticism and are attempting to do the best work that they can. And even when I see stuff that... I think is a little too, you know, one-sided from my perspective. It at least feels like it's being addressed or that there's it's being taken seriously. My feeling is like I'm more of a trust the journalist. Like I always look like who wrote this. There's mm -hmm. journalists that I trust. There's journalists that I don't trust. I don't just blanket trust something because it's from an institution. I Although I do think that certain institutions have a standard of reporting and ethics. Like we abide by ethical mm -hmm. guidelines, which a lot of people don't. Um, but I'm a huge supporter of independent journalism. I mean, there's people like Casey Newton. I don't know if you follow him. He's an independent journalist. He's he's he left. Um, he was a tech reporter. He has a podcast with The Times still, but he does his own thing. And okay. New, you know, just a great. There's 404 Media. They're a LA based tech publication that just does like phenomenal work that is completely independent, worker owned. Mm. So I don't think you have to be associated with these places, but I think they do do some good in the world. Do you think that like the the marketplace for nonpartisan media has basically disappeared or do you think that there's still hope for that because obviously we've seen like so many jobs in media be lost over the the past couple of years i think it's really hard i mean the thing is is that there's a massive the right-wing media ecosystem is so radically different and they have completely different funding models and business models than the sort of mainstream traditional media uh, and digital media, which was largely based on ads, which has been gutted. Mm. Um, I think it's really hard. I wish that there was more of a space for sort of like nonpartisan or just like 
fact-based reporting, less commentary. There's so much commentary online. I wish there was more just like, here's the facts of something, right? Mm. Um, the question is how you get an audience doing no, that. And no one wants that. No yeah. one wants that. That's the problem. They want to hear the news presented through a perspective. Right. No, definitely. Um, yeah. That's that's a tough one. Like, if I were to try to advise somebody on how they could do something in terms of media, it's like it, it really always comes back to personality. I yeah. know from our, our perspective with our content, it's like you could be the best technical interviewer but unless they vibe with you unless they like seeing you on camera and they feel like you're funny or cool or whatever it's just like that's kind of what everything hinges on well i feel that with my own audience like i've had people that have followed my work since i was a blogger and i always say i want people to give me stories and talk to me because of who i am not because i have the washington post attached to my name or the new york times attached to my name or anywhere else like if i was writing for you know abc.com or whatever it's something nonsense i guess abc is a real media company but just so, you know <laughs> i don't know like whatever like i would still i want them to come to me because they know my work and because they know that i'm a good journalist and they trust me mm. not because they want to be in the new york times that's like the biggest red flag definitely um so what made you want to write a book about the whole concept and the progression of what an influencer is i read the whole book over the, or almost the whole book i think i'm like 20% left the iBooks app says but uh what made you want to tackle this and uh what did you learn along the way I guess yeah well I started writing about this world in 2009 um so almost 15 years ago I felt like there's a lot of tech nonfiction books that are written about the platforms there's a great book called no filter about Instagram like comment subscribe by Mark Bergen about YouTube so and like the social network about Facebook, it, it's the story of the rise of social media has been told almost exclusively through the lens of these platforms and their corporate narratives. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to tell a story from the user side and talk about like how people were using these platforms and sort of tell this like platform agnostic story of here's how this whole half a trillion dollar industry emerged. Here were the notable moments and kind of just put some of that Internet history that I feel like is so lost to time because it's just been written on like BuzzFeed and viral sites that don't exist anymore. Like in a place like in a format that's not going to be deleted there are know? so many things that i like just names that i came across in that book that i was just like oh young <laughs> clout gang that's yes. right <laughs> i forgot about that yeah yeah oh man but like okay how difficult was the research because i feel like so much of this shit has been sort of erased from the internet a lot of times even when you go back to an old blog post it's like impossible all the hyper urls don't work and shit like i'm sure it was kind of difficult it to find everything it was so right? hard i honestly it took well i did around 600 interviews it took me two and a half years to report i did so much archiving i could not have done my book without the internet archive i know elon musk famously said that my family owns it it's not it's a non-profit i have no affiliation with it mm. um but i'm a big fan of it and um yeah it, there it's great it's basically like they archive all these old websites and stuff but there was so much stuff i mean just the original YouTube collab group, The Station, which had the first YouTube content house in Venice, right. I don't know if you remember them, mm -hmm. like that, that channel's gone, you know? So right. it's like, you can't pull those videos. You have to really go back. I actually reached out to a lot of people. I just talked to a lot of people from the era and I was like, do you have a copy of this first video or mm. do you remember this? And yeah. Can you even go view Vine? Is that shit yeah. archived? So that was one thing that they did, although I think Elon might not keep paying for it, but you can still view people's Vine profiles. Right. You just have to know the profile and the URL and go to it, but you can go to it on the web. I, I had such a mix of emotions reading the book because there are so many different moments where I couldn't help but like put myself in that position and be like, fuck, I should have known <laughs> that this kind of content was going to work at this point four or five years before I did or whatever. And even with Twitter, like now we just see so many things of just like people posting news like everybody just becoming mm -hmm. a news account and just embedding videos or even like the like the morbid full account and all these accounts that sort of exist just to take like exhilarating stories throughout history and just compact them into like a one paragraph description and that's a viral tweet and it's like why the fuck did nobody really think of that until like the last year or two i think it's mostly like the incentive of being able to get paid even though yeah. it's not that much money but still it's like if you had had that idea 10 years ago you could have you know reaped all the benefits and it would have kind of like forced social media to move at a way faster speed if you had kind of yeah. identified what was to come you know well, I also think like the creators that do end up pioneering those interesting new formats or use cases, like they benefit obviously from it, but it's just, they push those platforms forward. And mm. I think social platforms are such unique tech products because they're as, they're as defined by the people that use them 
as the products themselves. Like you go on Twitter for the people, right? You go on these platforms for the people that whose content you see on them, mm. which is unique. You know, other platforms like your iPhone or whatever, like you're just using the technology. So I think they're very susceptible to user behavior. And that's what my book gets into is sort of like the user's um content creators kind of like exerting power what led to you trying to become more and more of like a youtuber slash like tiktoker these days as opposed to i feel like you weren't doing that for a while no, like i was the... always doing a tiktok uh, oh okay. even back with musically i was posting on musically okay but was there like a period of time where you were kind of like oh i'm a serious journalist now so i don't want to necessarily <laughs> be making youtube vlogs and whatnot. yeah well youtube was always the one i had like a youtube channel with a friend in like 2014 i had friends that were really big youtubers and i just like looked like so much work it was so much work back mm. then so youtube was always like the one app that i never posted on i had i was obviously like big on tumblr twitter vine i was posting you know i ran the people magazine vine account too for a while oh, wow. um and i obviously had my snapchat show. i had multiple snapchat shows but people were really hostile to me about that like i don't know you probably don't remember this like niche media drama but for like the first half of the 2010s people we're always saying that I'm not a real journalist because I'm a blogger and I'm just an internet personality and that that means I'm not a real journalist. And so I think I had a little bit of a chip on my shoulder about it for a while. Mm. Where like, especially when I got to the New York Times, I was like, it was secondary. And I think it just, it was more like when the pandemic hit, I was like, whatever, I'm just gonna be making my videos because what else am I doing? And my TikTok blew up a little bit more. And I just was like, and then literally just in the past year since Twitter went down, I was like, all right, I should just post on YouTube. I don't know why I've been so late. It's just YouTube, you know, it's a lot of work. But is this stuff that anyone that you work for, do they have any kind of issue with it? Like, oh, this is the type of content that you should be putting in the post or whatever? Or is it so separate that they no, don't? No, I, if I have a story, it's going in the, in the post. Right. It's more just like there's stuff that I cover that's never going to go in the post because I just have like commentary on stuff or I make a video debunking stuff, right? Like, that's just videos. And they don't mind that. And I would happily make videos for the post if they wanted me to make a video. They're not really a video. They are they want my writing. And so that's what I do. I'm a writer. Right. I was kind of resentful of your YouTube channel because I had a bunch of, like, salacious shit that I wanted to ask about. And then I ended up watching your YouTube videos about it. And I'm like, oh, like, that didn't really happen the way that my internet brain had remembered <laughs> it or Wait, whatever. like, what? Um, you falsely accusing the guys of saying the word retarded, Mark Andreessen. Such bullshit. I just confused. <laughs> yeah, I just, I made videos debunking this, but I just fucking confused. There's two old white bald men that run this fucking VC firm that, mm. by the way, I don't cover. And I confused one for the other. It was Ben, it was, uh, Ben Horowitz instead of, wait, oh my God, I'm going to fuck it up today. Ben Horowitz it was instead ben of Horowitz Mark Andreessen. Instead of Mark yeah, Andreessen. Yeah. So it's like, oh, okay, I said the founder of one fucking thing instead of the founder of the other. And by the way, I wasn't the report, the original reporter that said that was not me. And you, you deleted it right away and you clarified. Yeah, exactly. Which to me, it it's kind of like, like well, 120 seconds. It's like, oh, sorry, I confused one fucking bald man for another in a single tweet once five years ago. Right. And I corrected it immediately. Like, shut the fuck up. If you're going to persecute me for that. Oh, please. Like, for sure you're allowed to give you some shit for getting that wrong, but to like still be talking about five years later and having that be like a critique of your character as a whole, I mean, that just seems kind of ridiculous. You know what's ridiculous. so fucked up and annoying is that my post was not necessarily defending him, but like my post was saying, I think it was during, it was like, this was like the era of Clubhouse. There was like seven people on stage and I don't know if you remember, but there was this big Clubhouse room about that. Like, oh, he said the slur and da 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 da. Mm. My post, the whole tweet that I'm like getting canceled for is like, I said, look, if you're going to call out Mark, well, be, sorry, Ben Horowitz is who had said it. Mm -hmm. Then call out the other seven people on stage because they were on there too and they didn't say anything. So if you're so offended by this word, which I think you have every right, if people feel that that's an offensive word, sure, totally. If that's how you feel, then call out all seven people. Don't just call out the one VC, which is so ironic because it's like kind of like, I was like kind of like low key like defending him. And then like, I mean, people are like, oh, you're trying to cancel him. I'm like, what? Whatever. There's a lot of people who don't want to let the word retarded go easy. Yeah, I mean, and I, I feel like it's kind of came back over the last year or so. I, it's so funny because I, I mean, I'm a child of the, I was a teenager in the 2000s, <laughs> right. and like I was recently watching. There's something about Mary. Have you seen that? Recently? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's there's so much in that movie where I'm like, oh my god, like people don't speak like this anymore. I, I, you know, my feeling is like, personally, I try to be sensitive. If somebody doesn't want language or somebody says, hey, that language is offensive, I, it's look, I, I don't care. You know, I'm not somebody that's. I'm, I want everybody I'm talking to to feel comfortable, so whatever. But right. I'm not the type to run around 
and police what other people are saying. So it was annoying that my tweet was framed that no, way. No, I mean, the the world has changed because my kid is currently, she's three years old, she's obsessed with princess books. And some of the narratives in these princess books are, like, absolutely terrible. Like, really shocking shit. I mean, Snow White, she's, she's like, passed out in the woods. Oh, yeah. And then a guy comes home and kisses <laughs> her and she comes back to life. And they fall in love. And, like, my kid is just geeked up over these stories. <laughs> And I'm kind of like we've we've slowly started to like kind of take the princess books away because yeah. we have other books now that are like way more positive and like teaching her you know good lessons and stuff. But a lot of this stuff from the '50s and shit is just like oh my god! Like I, you would really be doing your kid a disservice if you were like no, this is classic Americana. And we need my kid needs to read all these books. Yeah, like she's already on board with it to some extent. But like I don't know, it's just there. There is a lot of stuff that. I can get behind. Uh, I'm glad we're evolving. I think it's like you know, everybody do you evolve? I, I'm not a huge. I, I also think it's like who are you? Who who are you getting angry at? Are you getting angry at some 15 year old online? Are you getting angry at some 65 year old man? People grew up in different eras. Not to excuse it, but mm. you know. So why did you ultimately end up leaving the Times? I got a way better job offer. Oh really? It was that okay? The Times is just like. They don't pay you anything. Their whole thing is like, oh, well, you get to work at the New York Times. And right. it's like, I don't care. I've worked there for th almost three years and I got a book deal. Mm. And so it was like kind of like I was getting paid nothing. And once they've got you at the Times, it's always like, oh, what are you going to do? Like leave the Times? And I'm like, well, maybe if somebody's going to pay me way more money. And also my book deal, they're very uh, restrictive around book stuff. So like the way mm. that I want to promote my book, the stuff that I wanted to do, like that was going to be an issue. They're very controlling around books and weird about it. So I, it, I was kind of, I wasn't open to it, but like the post had been hitting me up a lot. And I was like, well, let me see what they'll offer me. I'll just throw something out. And if they give it to me, I'll do it. And they gave it to me. And I was like, why not? That's interesting. Cause there's definitely some people that I uh, have spoken to over the years of work at the times where I'm like, Oh, so you're just on board with this thing for the rest of your life. Oh, You like, could stay there. And by the way, it's impossible to get fired. They were a very strong union, which is great. Really? Like, you could stay there forever. Mm. And if I think if my goal was just to write articles for the next 40 years, sure. Mm. That's not – personally, I'm more into other stuff than that. I don't know – I like journalism, but I'm not – like, I don't want to be there forever. But it's it's a great – I mean, the people are really – I love my editor. I would have died for her. It, okay, so my favorite Times writer is John Caramonica. Of course. Huge fan. He and I tried to get him to do a podcast with me. We, we were going to do, I because I, yeah, when we were leaving, I wanted to do a podcast. That was another reason oh, okay. I left the Times. Interesting. Yes. He, uh, like, when I, it, it's weird to see his content, because to me, he's one of the best people talking about music and hip hop yeah. and shit, but he kind of gets, like, siloed into this weird world because of the Times image. Yes. That, like, the couple of times that I've heard, like, New York radio personalities beef with him, like Peter Rosenberg or Ebro getting into them on Twitter. I'm like, oh shit. Like it's it's just like kind of weird to see them even talking to him because the Times brand is like, no, you don't go argue with people on yeah. Twitter, which really I think was probably a big part of why people kind of felt a way about you at a certain point is that you were just a lot more outgoing on social media. I know, I, I don't know that they love that. Although I never got in trouble for it. So mm. whatever. I actually did get in trouble. The one time I got in trouble. I was mi I missed the C train one time and I tweeted like all caps like I fucking hate America or something and I got to work my boss was like don't just say that and I was like oh I have to be patriotic now um but yeah John is great I mean he has podcast now with Joe too he, oh yeah, he yeah, was yeah. Doing that. they're adapting they're great um John is really great I mean there's a lot of great culture it's just John is somebody that's been there for a long time and I think is a phenomenal reporter and I don't know you know I think he could leave and be very successful but I think he likes it you think he should start a sub stack you got, I don't I don't know the whole Substack thing, but if I was New York Times, I would not let him go start a Substack. No. That's like their thing. Yeah. No, yeah. Well, they're I'm sure they they love John, and I think they want to keep him. Okay, interesting. Um, so Barry Weiss left around the same time. You, oh yeah. You, that's a narrative that I had some people pitch to me as like you should basically like go in on that. Like this is Nikki and Cardi B right here. Like you need to pit them <laughs> against each other. Is well, that she's accurate? She's not a journalist. She's oh. not a journalist. She worked on the opinion section, so okay. she never worked in the newsroom, mm. which you know I think is a big distinction. And I think Barry, um, you know Barry posted a lot of false shit about the newsroom. And that's what annoyed me about it. Like, look, I don't think it was, I mean, I was there in 2020 when people were doing like the ax emoji on her name and she was like, I'm being bullied. I don't think people were nice to her. I'm sympathetic to that. Um, but she never worked in the newsroom. She was always on the opinion side. So my feeling is like, I don't speak on the opinion side of the New York times. I've never worked on that side. It's completely separate from the newsroom. 
she's never worked as an actual journalist at the New York Times. She's never worked as a reporter. Mm. So why are you speaking on that? And now she's got her little, you know, whatever thing going, her media company, where she just posts, like, biased shit all day, which is fine. I mean, she's an opinion columnist, but, like, I don't know. I've had friends that have worked for her, and it's... They didn't love it? She has a specific point of view. If you want to, if you agree with her worldview, and by the way, I think a lot of media, I'm not singling her out. If you agree with her her worldview and you want to write articles that never challenge that worldview, mm. go work at the free press. But they've done some work that I was like really impressed by, like in particular that fucking uh, dog walker or was it a bird watcher in New York who got uh, smeared as being racist? He didn't. That... Yeah, let's be clear. She wasn't the one that debunked okay. that. You're yeah. right. But it came on her platform. So I was like, kind of. Uh, yeah, she <laughs> loves to grift off other people. I mean, look, I think there is a there is a um, role for for debunking those types of like viral things that feed into people's narrative. Like, that's great. Um I think generally she doesn't really do that stuff. She kind of posts a lot of just like opinion, commentary and opinion, which mm. by the way, that is what she's good at. That is what she did at the New York times. She posted, she's a commentator and an opinion person and she's great at it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's also when you cater to powerful people, when you tell, you know, all these people what they want to hear, you're going to get a lot of money and funding for your media company. Mm. If I went out and said, actually billionaires are so great and the wokes are coming to cancel me and <laughs> I need $10 million for my media company, please. Cause I'm being silenced. Sure. I bet I could actually raise money. That is probably my main complaint too, is this is like that, that bird watcher story. Or, am I fucking it up? Is a dog walker? Yeah. No, it was a dog no, walker. It, yeah. It was like the dog. I think it was a dog walker. But yeah. Then, yeah. It was like a vaguely racial conflict. I yeah. forget exactly how it well, went. Well, the but, guy was like a bird watcher. Right. There's just, I feel like there's just a little too much of that for my taste of just like, well, you thought that this story was this one way, but actually it was quite different. I don't know if I'm maybe like oversimplifying, but like uh, there's definitely been moments where I'm like, do you not get tired of just sort of running this? I thing just think over it's like, over? do it for the other side. Mm. Like, that's my issue with people like that. I'm like, great, debunk the, yes, the woke person was wrong or whatever in this instance and by the way all of those types of things like all those kind of viral stories like they're always more complicated than you imagine but it's just so exhausting it's like lady shut up you're not being like it's this persecution complex that a lot of those people have where i'm like you've got millions of dollars you've got your own media platform you're on bill maher all the time like, you have a huge platform you're not being censored they like, would say that they're speaking on behalf of people who don't have the power and the luxury of you know making no, a shitload of money they're all they're doing is defending institutional power that's what her whole platform's about she's certainly not defending underrepresented groups she's certainly not defending you know people who have been deplatformed when is the last time she she platformed you know Somebody that's like the porn stars, the people that have actually been silent. Like she's not doing that. Mm. That I would respect the hell out of her if she did that. But I've tried to get you to pick up on that in the past. Of like, we need to draw attention to the way that these social media platforms are. Like the main thing that really got me was just uh, like early pandemic when every porn star was just losing their Instagram yeah. over and over and over, and it was like. There's this whole CD network of people like, you know, charging girls to get their pages back and shit. Yeah. And I always felt like I couldn't really get anybody to take it serious or want to draw attention to it, even though now it feels like it's gotten a little bit better. But I still hear about this kind of stuff quite a bit. I don't even know if it's gotten that much better. I do think that it's I mean, here's the thing with with the losing access to the account is that Instagram openly says we don't want these types of people on our page mm. and they are going to ban them and they're shitty to them. And it's almost like. It's hard to kind of think of a angle on that sometimes. But I mean, I wrote about, what did I write? I, I mean, I've written a few stories about that. I've written about people getting banned and I've written about nudity and I actually wrote about the nudist community on Twitter, the nudist, like who are just non-sexual nudists, which mm. is a whole community. They've been pushed, they were pushed off Tumblr. They were pushed off Instagram. Like Twitter is their last bastion because it's the only app that allows even nudity that's really funny because i was reading this book about the history of the porn industry in america and that's one thing that i got from it is that there was basically like you could buy a, a videotape of a nudist colony way before people started actually making porn that's so crazy just because this was like the only reason or the only place that they could find a bunch of naked people it hadn't really occurred to them to like get people to get naked yeah like we have to go find the people that are already <laughs> naked there's a great uh, nudist bar in Key West. I think it's called like Garden of Eden or something. Really? Oh yeah, it's it's all a bunch of old nude, extremely suntanned. And you people. can wear clothes, or you have to not wear. clothes? You can wear clothes, but it feels weird to go there clothed. I mean, I went there clothed 
in the <laughs> dress, and weird. I felt weird as fuck. <laughs> Holy shit, that's super funny. Um, did you um, did you feel like you only truly became like a scapegoat slash target of the right from the libs of TikTok thing, or did that just further add to it? Because I feel like that was kind of like the main thing. Yeah, I think it was actually when Tucker Tucker Carlson started mm. doing a lot of segments on me in like 2021, 2020. Right. So he sort of like latched on to me for whatever reason. And just like none of it, it was so weird. None of it was ever about my articles. It was just like this woman, like, you know, eh, whatever, we hate her. Um, so I think like Fox News started. And then, of course, I did. I mean, I've always reported on right wing influencers, mm -hmm. but I think like the libs of TikTok thing pissed people off because I revealed her identity and people disagree with that decision. Right. I totally stand by that decision. But um yeah, I think that was like a turn. I think like the Tucker kind of like lit the flames and then the libs of TikTok was like kerosene. And now everyone thinks they have a certain perspective about me now, I think. Right. I kind of liked like the OG libs of TikTok where it felt less editorial and more just like, hey, look at this crazy thing we found on TikTok. When there wasn't like in-depth captions and shit, I felt like they were doing a little bit more of a service in terms of like, hey, you can make of this whatever you want, whereas now it feels well, more activist. -y. I'm a fan of cringe accounts. Like, I don't know if you follow right. fave TikToks 420. Like, there's a lot of cringe accounts that have a specific type of cringe. And, like, I love those accounts. And, look, some of them are making fun of sort of, or, like, kind of tongue-in-cheek jokes. A lot of them are, like, ethical, and they will take things down if content creators ask. But, like, mm -hmm. you know, I wrote a piece in Rolling Stone last year, like, defending cringe and sort of, like, cringe content and, like, there's a lot of people making intentional cringe, you know? I think LGBTQ people have always been seen as cringe in certain communities. And yeah, like if she was just sharing cringe stuff from LGBTQ people, like whatever, that's her right to do. It's her like, she tweeted out the fucking names and addresses of LGBTQ people. Mm. And also she's directly influencing, I mean, my feeling was like she was directly influencing state legislation in Florida. And I don't think that you should be able to do that anonymously. Mm. Um, and yeah, she's just so, she's editorializing the hell out of it. Like it's like that wasn't a neutral. I don't back. I didn't follow her pre Joe Rogan started to talk about her, but she just got like really extreme. And I totally agree. It's like if you're just had a feed of TikToks, there's so many accounts like that, and right. they're not controversial. Right, because yeah, there are so many like women posting L's type totally, accounts at totally. this point that the libs of TikTok do kind of like blend in with all that shit at this point. Whereas they kind of helped pioneer that, or at least got like the most attention. They for rode, it. they rode off that trend, but she made it into this like reactionary thing, and she started fully doxing these teachers and trying to get people fired. Mm. And that's what I think's fucked up. And actually, most people that post those other cringe accounts, like they do generally have they don't want to get their accounts taken down for harassment so like if you message them they'll generally take it down and a lot of girls make intent i mean that's what i wrote about a lot of people generally make cr cringe content intentionally hoping to get on those accounts and go viral mm. oh really yeah really yes hmm well that might fundamentally change how i view some of that stuff going oh so forward. much of it is totally <laughs> intentional because that's how i feel watching everything like porn adjacent on the internet i'm just like oh you guys think this shit is all real and you don't realize that all these people are just running plays on you yeah. to get attention myself included yeah yeah wow that's interesting yeah i'm gonna have to think about that more um are you gonna be copping the the trump sneakers oh my god <laughs> they're so funny <laughs> I wonder if he's going to get people were saying like, oh, he might get sued by Christian Louboutin for the red soul. Oh, really? Yeah. Because they have the red soul. And you're like Christian Louboutin's like really come hard after shoe manufacturers that use the red soul. Really? I didn't know that. Yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah. I have a lot of from my time on the campaign trail. I think I have enough Trump merch in mm. my house. Do you really? Oh, God, just have, like, random, yeah, from, like, I mean, just events that I've been at that they've handed stuff out. I remember in 2018, I found a Make America Great Again hat in the gym in, like, a <laughs> random locker, and I was, like, freaking out, like, oh, my God, I'm so hyped that I just found this, but was also, like, very concerned that I might run into some sort of controversy if yeah. somebody saw me holding it waiting for the uber outside, so I was, like, <laughs> putting it under my shirt and shit, I don't know. Um, okay, last question. How old are you? And what is with the controversy about your <laughs> age? I know, there's age? so much controversy about my age, which I think is hilarious because it's very clear when I graduated. And also, like, people that I went to high school and middle school with and college with are, like, on the internet. And right. people think that I'm older. The reason that I don't post about my birthday is because I'm constantly being doxxed and right. swatted and all this shit. So it's like, 
you know, look, I've been on 40 under 40 lists recently. Right. If people really want to find my age, I don't think it's hard to find. I think they've manufactured a conspiracy in their own head where they think for whatever reason I'm secretly in my 40s and I, there's some missing decade. When I, I saw like a clip of Tucker saying that you were 45 or something and you know, I was just like, there's no way she's not 45. No. I know what a 45 year old woman looks like. Also, she's not 45. Wait, Tucker. I know Tucker did such a 180 because the first time that Tucker was started ranting about me, he said I was too young and I was a mm. little girl in my 20s. And I was like, I'm not in my 20s. I'm in my 30s. Um, and yeah, and then I flipped. The New York Times gave some statement, I think, or I gave a statement that was like, she's been a journalist for 10 years. Like, he was saying I was too young and too silly. I was a silly little girl. Mm. And then it flipped to like, oh no, she's, she's actually an old, old hag. hag. <laughs> she's an old hag. But Holy it's like, shit. my feeling is too, like, I don't want to be like, oh, I'm not 45. Because it's like, so what? So what if I was 45? Right. So what if I was 55? As someone who recently turned 40, I kind of, it makes me think a little <laughs> differently when I watch old podcast clips of myself talking about people who are in their 40s as if they're like on their deathbed. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm always dying because people are always like, oh, you know, you're, oh, you're too old to cover YouTubers. And I'm like, okay, like, look at the YouTube. Like, how old is Ethan Klein or, or Trisha or Keemstar or whatever? It's like, Shane Dawson, like these people are, YouTube is not all Gen Z, you mm. know? And that's really something we have to all look forward to is basically YouTubers aging out of their position on YouTube and watching like how they sort of scramble to make some kind of life for themselves after the fact. I don't even want to name anybody because everyone who comes to mind <laughs> is somebody that I'm friendly with, but like, I don't know that it's, it's like, a lot of people just kind of slowly lose their audience and then they have to figure out how to morph into something else. Well, I think it's too, like, what is your audience based on? Like, is your audience based on, like, knowing a niche? I mean, I follow this, like, bike YouTuber who's, like, 55 and, like, wonderful and he just, like, repairs bikes and talks about bikes and, like, mm. no one's, like, you're too old, you know? They're, like, right. you've got your thing. But I think it's, like, if you're trying to be in the mix on, like, YouTuber culture. Right. Although, I don't know. I mean, people are around. I, I, yeah, Jason Nash is famously still doing his around, thing. Doing his just thing. married a woman who's like 32. Oh, really? Did, Shout I out know to him. Yeah. What, yeah. Good for Congratulations, him. Jason Nash. Yeah. yeah. I, I think the whole age obsession is weird on the internet because also the internet is defined by users of all age. Like I've written a lot about like boomers and sort of like no one's more online than mothers. Like the mom universe on the internet is crazy and mm. mom groups and yeah. That's the ultimate Taylor Lorenz groomer allegation that I forgot about, though, <laughs> is that you took Kelly Ann Conway's daughter, right, and convinced her to come out against her. No. Was this yeah. it? Wait, no, let's talk about this. This is so funny. Let me clear up all the drama. So, Kelly Ann Conway's daughter had given an interview to Business Insider. She went viral on TikTok. Okay. She was viral on TikTok for like four days because she made all these TikToks saying, like, fuck Trump. And by the way, like, I disagree with my parents. This was a sensation on Twitter because oh. nobody could believe that this, this kid was like, just going rogue like that. Yeah. But like classic Twitter mentality mm. where like this thing is viral for four days on TikTok. She's got a match, she's got millions of like huge amount of attention. She's been asked to give interviews. I was like, I'm not even doing a story on this because, like, whatever, it's funny. But, like, I didn't think it was worth a story at that point. So all I do is, like, you know, hit the download button on TikTok and tweet it out. And just because I knew she was underage, I was like, I'm going to be nice just in case and just, like, send a message and say, hey, I'm a reporter. By the way, I shared your content on TikTok or on Twitter. Mm. But if you want me to take it down, let me know because I don't want, you know, you are still underage. And, like, I am sharing it to an audience on Twitter. And she responded, no, no, it's totally fine. And I said, okay, well, here's my number. If you want to give it to your mother, because I was like, maybe I'll get comment from her mother. Um, here it is. That was it. That's the entirety of the exchange. Mm. And for whatever reason, and then by the way, she had, again, she had given an interview to Business Insider. She was already viral. But then like my tweet, people were like, oh my God, you're whatever. I'm like, this post has millions of views on TikTok. Why are you acting like I... It's just that, like, you didn't, you were not on TikTok. This was in 2022. So, like, mm. they weren't paying attention to TikTok. But it's like, I never wrote an article about her, ever. I never reported on her in any way. I just posted about her on Twitter. Right. And she had, like, she gave multiple interviews to journalist outlets and did media. Like, I wasn't even part of that. Right. I want to know what's going on with that family these days. I well, I wish they had some sort of reality show. Right. Oh my God, that'd be amazing. But they, they kind of went quiet after that, right? Yeah. Well, there was like conflict. And I'm I'm like sympathetic to her. I mean, like, I don't agree with my parents on everything. I have a, you know, diverse family. And that was, they had that, the parents had that messy divorce. Or there, there, there was, there's always some drama with mm. the parents. So, yeah. Well, I feel like we've uh, hit a lot of the hot topics that people probably <laughs> uh, like, like, the, 
in this interview, we debunked like Tucker's like one minute spiel that he'll just kind of do about you where he just like lists off a bunch of controversies. <laughs> I feel like this would probably be handy to a lot of people to just kind of take that stuff at face value. But why should people read the book? And yeah. What do you think it is that people need this book for? I think it's just I, I think for anybody that uses the Internet, like you said, it's like a really good history of kind of where we came from. And I think it helps you think about even just look at platforms now, like if you're somebody that makes content or even consumes a lot of content, like look at the Internet differently and understand where things came from. I think mm. there's a lot of narratives. A lot of people like think that they know the history of the Internet or think that they know where like the content creator industry came from. And I mean, there's just a lot. There's a lot happened. Yeah, like my recommendation to my wife, I said, because, you know, her time is uh, very limited with the whole mom thing as well as her career. And she was like, how's the book? And I was like, honestly, I do think it would be a worthwhile read for you because it would kind of put what you're doing with your life into context in terms of like how this even became a thing, which for me as somebody who's been online since like the late 90s, a lot of this was just kind of like a walk down memory lane of being like, oh, yeah, I remember when that happened. I remember when that website <laughs> mattered, when that when, like even I couldn't really remember why MySpace overtook Friendster. And as I read your account of it, I was kind of like a lot of this was just like small aesthetic design choices that mm -hmm. just worked for a different generation obviously like friendster like basically losing like having like terrible uh you know web ability to yeah. handle the traffic was one thing but even like facebook kind of con conquering myspace was like like what was it why do we all turn away from myspace when we all had thousands of followers built up on there and facebook was kind of plain and boring in comparison but like you know it, it, it just helps to sort of see my whole life a little bit more clearer yeah. i think anyone who's like maybe 40 and under too, like it's very much nostalgic and you'll be like, Oh, I remember this or like, mm. whatever happened to those Viners or like what, what did happen there? You know, somehow I missed that the lonely girl thing was scripted. Oh really? Yeah. I like never <laughs> really caught the idea that it was scripted. Yeah. I only remember that it existed. You know what's yeah. very funny? Greg Goodfried who co-created that is now Charlie D'Amelio's manager. Really? Yeah. Wow. It's like funny. When you read that lonely girl 15 thing, you're just like, Oh my God. Like, people could have been doing this so early on. Mm -hmm. This is stuff that is kind of being treated like it's new now, like yeah. playing characters on social media. It's kind of amazing that somebody grasped onto that so early. Yeah. Greg yeah. has been in it, and he's, well, he discovered Charlie, and yeah. Definitely. Like, um, okay, so everybody get the book. Yeah, get and, the book, Extremely Online. And if you wanted them to follow one social network of yours, is it TikTok? Is yeah, it my, I'm mostly TikTok, Instagram, and YouTube now, because I'm so, I have no followers on YouTube, but I am there now. Mm, okay. So subscribe. Taylor Lorenz, appreciate you. Thanks Thank you for, for your time. Thanks for having me. Thank you. No Jumper, coolest podcast in the world. Check us out on YouTube, TikTok, Patreon, Instagram. Like, comment, subscribe, nojumper.com if you want to support.